afternoon and welcome to episode five of the OpenStack Now podcast. We are here with Adrian Cockroft, who is a technology fellow at the Battery Ventures investment firm. And uh, you may also know him from his time as cloud architect at Netflix. Uh, Adrian has become quite a pundit on the uh, microservices front, and we're going to be hearing from him today about all kinds of technical issues. Uh, so uh, welcome, Adrian, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Thanks very much. Good to be here. So uh, you are currently at OzCon. Mm -hmm. So how has that been? Anything particularly exciting? Well, it's a really big event. Um, I haven't been that many times in the past. I was here in 2011, and sort of it's so I'm sort of trying different conferences. Um, so trying to figure them out, like figure out who's here, what is it all about. It's a huge conference. Um, they reduced it from 18 tracks wide for the main sessions to 13 tracks this year, which is still way too many. But um, there have been some good keynotes, and it's great to see the open source ecosystem really moving to be the mainstream way things happen nowadays, rather than being kind of like, hey, listen to us. It's not a we're actually in charge now. That's kind of the, the way it feels here. What do you think makes that different? I mean, what do you think changes when that happens? Well, big vendors are here, so the, you know, the primary sponsor is IBM, and the secondary sponsors are HP, so the, the big enterprise vendors realize they have to do open source and support it, um, and it's not, they have, they're having to embrace it rather than see it as a threat, um, and it's just, you know, the ecosystem is very mature, there's an awful lot of products and options, I think that the, over the last you know, five, ten years, people have finally realized that the, the best software you can get in the world now is the open source software. The, the proprietary systems that used to be the kind of leading edge stuff is actually fallen behind now um, so far that it's, you know, you, you can pay a lot more for it and it doesn't work as well. <laughs> kind of typical. Why do you think, why do you think that has happened? I mean, that just seems so counterintuitive that... <clears throat> software that you can pick up without spending a ton of money that that people wouldn't have the incentive to build it and yet it's happened if there's a couple of things depends where which what parts of the stack you're looking at but, um you're seeing basically the 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 places where where software research happens now are the are the big web scale companies so what comes out of google and facebook and you know, Twitter, Netflix, LinkedIn, right? that, that's you know, Yahoo. That, those are the major software packages that, that people are really using nowadays. And they're the bleeding edge. That's where everything's happening. So um, if you're off in an enterprise with a, you know, a team building something, it takes, just takes too long and the team is too small and they don't really understand the customer need. So they're inventing a customer need and the little team goes and builds something and then they put a multi-million dollar marketing campaign on it and you know, it's just, you know, there's, there's more effort in polishing it than actually building it quite often. I, mean, I, I spent 16 years at Sun, so I kind of lived that world for a while and that for a long time that was the best software you, you could get because we had, we had really good people at Sun. But nowadays the community of uh, end users has basically turned into the driving force for, for getting things done. Now, of course, the big news this week, Google and Kubernetes, and um, that must be really kind of up your alley in a lot of ways. Yeah, we were um, saying everyone needs a foundation now. That was sort of, it's got a little bit, but to some extent, it's like, how many foundations should there be? Um, I think that's interesting. What, what's generally happened there is that, um, well, what happened with, with Kubernetes in particular was that people were talking to Google and saying, well, we like the software, but we kind of don't like the idea that it's a Google project and you own it and, you know, you could go off and do random things with it, but, but, you know, so we'd like to commit to it and, but we'd like to, um, you to give up, um, give up ownership of it effectively and slow down the rate of change a little bit as, as it's sort of matured. So they've reached the 1.0 level and they said, okay, it's a relatively stable set of interfaces. We've gone through the rapid evolution phase. We're now going to try and settle it down a little bit, make it into something that you can use in production. Um, and that is typically the right time. You know, if you're setting up a standards body, rough consensus and working code is the, you know, the basis for standards that work. So getting it out there, 
and then saying, okay, we're giving this up for adoption, we're going to form a group around it. And, uh, you know, it's, I think it's the right timing. I think you saw that with Docker as well, like with the uh, run C. It's like, okay, rough consensus, working code, donated in, neutralize any kind of concerns people had about um, you know, the fundamental pieces of the ecosystem. So it's, it's, you know, that's what's driving this. It's just a bunch of things maturing right now. Gotcha. Now, John, you've been doing a lot of work with Kubernetes and OpenStack. And Indeed. Ron. So, um, you know, what's, what do you feel is something that we need to look at? Um, well, I'm, I'm um, excited, obviously, by the one I launch. Um, we uh, uh, we um, uh, have a lot uh, of internal uh, cycles invested now in making Kubernetes work very well on Miranda's OpenStack and uh, in several modes. Um, and that ties in with other initiatives uh, like uh, Murano Application Catalog and then OpenStack Community Application Catalog uh, to facilitate deployment. Um, it's very much a part of um, of our uh, go forward at uh, you know at, at this point, um, uh, probably along with uh, uh, other approaches to container-based uh, platform as a service that may, in different situations, be more. Uh, you know, effective for individual users, um, but it's a it's certainly a beautiful, simple architecture, and it does many, many of the things that uh, that people want uh, an orchestration layer to do. Um, so, which brings me, Adrian, to the whole question. I mean, you know, again, we're back at okay, OpenStack containers. You know, you are you are going to be speaking. Uh, next month at uh, OpenStack Silicon Valley, at, which is dedicated to the whole intersection between the two. So I'd really like to hear kind of your feeling on containers and microservices and OpenStack and how those three things fit together. Yeah, well, I think OpenStack's done, done a great job of gathering the industry around one standard for managing the things in the data center. Uh, uh, to think of it as like if you make a PCI card, you have to have a Linux device driver, otherwise it can't plug into the hardware. It's just standard. You just have to do that. Maybe there's a Windows one, maybe there's a few others, but you know, the standard for infrastructure is you can have a Linux operating system, you need a device driver. And at the data center level, if you're going to produce a piece of equipment that sits in the data center nowadays, it, it has to have an OpenStack driver, right? It's got to be able to integrate into that ecosystem. Um, but that's generally what some people call the southbound APIs, the APIs that point into the infrastructure to manage the things and do you know, hook up the networking and the storage and, the, and all the other pieces, you need to do that. Um, what I've seen over, over time, though, is that you know, there was a lot of focus on getting that done in OpenStack, and it's really been needed because every vendor had their own different way of doing it over the years, and bringing that together in one, one sort of consortium has actually been very powerful. But the North, to some extent, the concerns of the developers and how do you put applications on that were secondary concern for a long time. And those side, that side of it, what I call the northbound APIs, has been fairly immature. And there's been some work on it and been some, um, you know, some good project work there, but it's generally been later and it's been less focused. And what I see with Kubernetes is a good northbound API that's quite rich and functional and addresses a lot of the needs of application developers. And once you graph that on top of OpenStack, you're actually meeting a lot of that, you know, a lot of the need for that functionality. You've got a good scheduler there. And we're starting to see the sort of PaaS layer commoditize a little bit with, with Docker in particular. It's like if you can stick it in a Docker container, I don't really care where it runs. <laughs> and you can go download Redis from Docker Hub and say, you know, I'm going to put that on, on Kubernetes. I'm going to put it on Mesos directly. I'm going to put it on AWS or Azure or you know DigitalOcean, I, I just don't care anymore. I I've just got my application is defined as you know my front end and Redis and whatever you know some collection of things or my my SQL. So there's a bunch of standard containers there that are very portable. That basically takes the PaaS layer and says you know there's some interesting capabilities there, but it's not. Uh, and I use some of those for my application perhaps, but I can build something that's pretty portable and have the where it runs be a separate separate concern to some extent. Okay. So um, 
uh, on the sort of technological. I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. Um, I, I was just going to ask: Do you think that there's an implicit um, competition between the 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 the, the 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 northbound and the southbound APIs for for um, I, I wouldn't say dominance, but uh, but uh, it, it seems to me that people who who are in the position of having to manage um, applications running on infrastructure, and many people are in those hybrid positions, um, they can't uh, enjoy the beauty of abstraction. Um, as much as you know, an application programmer who has reduced his or her application to, you know, to to uh, abstract services can. Um, which which API is is you know is there a need for unified API? Maybe is another way of of asking the question that that both does, you know, reach downward into infrastructure and and um, dwell up at the layer where it's you know allocating abstract resources to applications. Well, I mean, that's really the virtualization layers are what separate those two. Um, the way, that, I mean, a, a cloud for me is a, is a self-service API-driven infrastructure. That's that's the key piece. I mean, there's a bunch of other things that, that make up a cloud. But um, if you're still filing tickets and clicking on a UI to get something done, you've kind of got virtualization going, but you haven't really got to the, 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 the automatable API-driven cloud. So... In this new world, you've got applications that, and deployment systems, continuous integration, continuous delivery systems that are driving infrastructure through APIs. And that's the automation layer. That's the you know, not the application itself. It's the tooling. It's the control planes that make it work. So there's really three sets of APIs in cloud. There's the bits that point downwards into making a switch work. Right? You've got to hook up all of your switch and storage and fire up machines and then there's the control plane APIs for managing that um, and then there's the application APIs for actually scheduling and running you know making things run so things like um, you know queuing services or um, you know, whatever there's you know, a database as a service those kinds of things that applications want to see and see this with all three of those it's not that any one of them's in, in charge or, or more important you've got to have all three of those and I think the 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 big vendor, you know, vendors have products that they need to build interfaces to, and you know, Cisco is very concerned about making sure that you can manage all its switches with OpenStack or whatever, right? So there's, there's, those are what that's driven a lot of the development, I think, up to now. And people are going, okay, now we have it running. I have this OpenStack thing, and they go to the developers and say, can you use it, please? And say, well, you know, it doesn't have all these nice APIs I want to use that I can get on public cloud. So how do I add in? You know, a queuing service or a notification service or, or whatever it is that they've found useful or database as a service. There's all these different things that they've kind of seen that are available um, on AWS, for example. And then they're going, okay, how do, what's the equivalent set? How do we make the set of things you can do be more common across them? So maybe you put you know, a Cloud Foundry on, 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 on top of OpenStack and say, okay, that gives us a, a set of core services for service discovery and building out your microservices on it that I can then move around, put that on you know, some other platform, put it on public and private, and do my sort of cloud bursting if I need extra capacity, all those kinds of things. So that's, I think we're starting to see, okay, we've got it working. How do we put applications on it? And how do we go from um, largely sort of evaluation and getting it to work phase to largely we've just got this running um, you know that's what runs the business right so it seems by having this sort of microservices driven architecture it really uh, enables a much more hybrid architecture yeah so well it's also that microservices tie into um, DevOps work practices um, it's a more cell based operation so you, you you have groups of people who uh, you know, own the own the delivery of a system, uh, or delivery of the services that make up a system, and they um, they own what it specifying what it looks like. They're on call when it breaks. They own the evolution and the, and the improvement of it. And that's sort of and you organize your your company as these little sort of cellular groups of people that own a service, rather than organizing it as teams working on a project. And when you deliver the project, you throw it over the wall. 
hope that somebody else can figure out how to make it run and move on to the next project and everyone scatters to a bunch of different projects. So there's, a, there's this move from being project-based to product-based and that ties into, and all the automation you need to do that is actually kind of the cloud piece, if you like. So the microservices is really a tactic or a, it's the architecture you get when you move to this more product ownership, DevOps-like continuous delivery world. Uh, you know, microservices, it's a software architecture that just emerges, you know, given Conway's law, which says that the code's <laughs> going to end up looking like the organization. It emerges from organizations that are working in this way that you end up writing your own services and with APIs that stable APIs to everyone else. So think of that as more of the org chart turning into the code. So I, I'm going to change. Uh, I'm going to change the subject just a tiny bit. Okay, quite a lot actually. Um, you have, in many ways, what I consider to be an ideal job. Mm -hmm. I mean, your job is to just go out and look at all different kinds of technologies and, yeah. and evaluate them. So, I yeah. mean, what is that like? Is it as cool as it sounds like it should be? It's a very cool job, and I, I still don't quite know how I managed to talk myself into it. Um, <laughs> there's a a handful of people that have this kind of job around around the VC industry. So I'm not a regular VC partner. Um, I don't I don't write the checks. I don't figure out exactly who should get how much money and, and you know write the write the term sheets and things like that. So what I do do is try and attract people to the kind of investment thesis we have. So every VC firm has a set of th ideas about the industry and where it's going that it wants to invest in, and um, by going to conferences and talking about things, basically, if some little startup hears me at a conference and goes, oh, that's in my space. Yeah, I was at DockerCon. Okay, I'm in the Docker ecosystem. We should go talk to Battery Ventures about this idea we have because Adrian's obviously interested enough to turn up at that type of conference, right? And that's, that's part of attracting people. And what we're trying to do, actually, is get into early stage investors, which are quite often people that are still at their day job at some big company, thinking about that company they'd like to form. <laughs> and you get these sort of secret conversations where they kind of, they, 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 you know, they quietly contact you. And we have a series of meetings where we, we start eva evolving the idea. So really getting in and giving them lots of advice and being very helpful. And if what they want to do matches what we're interested in, then we're kind of the natural place to do the seed round. Uh, generally, if you want to do a seed round, you just go running up and down Sand Hill Road saying, hey, I've got this idea. You won't get very many takers because nobody knows who you are or you've got no background, right? There's a lot of trust building and uh, relationship building that's needed to get that going. And particularly right now, focused on trying to find uh, companies in that space. So that's my kind of outbound um, acting as a magnet for interesting companies in, in this space. So that's one piece of what I do anyway. I, the back end, what I do is once we get companies in-house in as a, effectively as portfolio companies, I act as effectively a consultant to the CTO, um, you know, technology advice, depending on what kind of business they're in, um, you know, a more or less role. Yeah, some places where I have good domain knowledge. And then the third thing is that there are a lot of big companies going through the digital transformation now. You know, big uh, banks and large, really, you know, the big enterprise, you know, Fortune 100, Fortune 1000 companies. And they're fascinated by, you know, the Netflix story or whatever. And that, so <laughs> they kind of want to hear stuff like that. And what I want to know is what's your technology stack look like? Okay, so you've got an open stack thing now. Who's, which pieces did you put in that? You know, which networking piece have you got? What... Where did you get the hardware from? Which which distribution is it? Where are the gaps? Um, you know, and then we can go back and say, okay, there's a gap here because people are all struggling with this particular piece, and we can go talk to our portfolio and, or find somebody to fill that. Well, then when a portfolio company comes through and says, I have this great security product and it's being used by this bank over here, we can go talk to the bank and find out whether they're really using it and whether we really should invest <laughs> in that startup. So we do the sort of background <laughs> reference check thing. So those are really the three things I do. You know, it's at lots of conferences, um, you know, reviewing companies and and helping them out, and then the sort of wider talking to big big end users about what they really need. It's gotcha. a fun job. I have to say, the first part of your job sounds like you are involved in the fantasy that probably two thirds of the people listening to this podcast have every night when they go to bed. <laughs> 
It's like, yeah. if only I could find somebody to help me develop this idea. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, the. Yeah, the, the, it's hard to find the ones that actually get somebody excited to invest, though. I mean, as well as the trust level, you've got to find... I mean, most people can see there's a little bit of pain somewhere and they could build a thing that solves that pain. Um, that usually looks too much like a feature of something else. Or, you know, some vendor could also notice the pain and in a, a month build that too, right? So how that sustainable competitive difference is, is difficult, right? So how do you find a real, a real thing there? Um, the ones that the companies that are really hard to build are the companies that create a new market because no one knows, no, no one buys that right <laughs> this is a market that doesn't exist but they're the ones that become big because if you can define and create a market you go you know let's start a new electric car company you know that kind of Elon Musk sort of approach if you read Elon Musk's biography he's like totally sort of bloody minded I'm going to create a company from scratch I'm not just creating a company I'm creating a market let's let's do commercial space flight it's like he's got to knock down these enormous problems. But the value you get out of that's huge. But the, the skepticism you get as you go in is also huge. So you have to try and explain that there could be a market here that no one else can see. Those are the difficult ones to launch, but they're much more valuable. So sometimes you get sort of trapped somewhere between those two where it's kind of, well, yeah, that's kind of a thing, but it's not really a big thing. You know, it is, it is difficult to, to get really good ideas that are, that are fundable. So there's a, we look at thousands of companies a year and we fund you know, 20 or so. Excellent. Okay. John, did you have any other questions? No, I don't think so. <clears throat> it's been, uh, I, I must say, a great pleasure um, listening to a little bit of, uh, of how you think. Um, it's, um, it, it's, it's clear that you have taken what seems a, you know, a deep engineering background, and um, and uh, d developed both a, um, a you know very broad analytic base and um, and uh, significant capacity to communicate about it. Obviously, both of those are critical in your current position. I get lots of practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I've been doing for the last year and a half, I mean, before I left Netflix, I was going around talking about what Netflix was doing and people were pulling on me on all these other kind of, how do you organize companies? How does this technology look like? And since I left Netflix, I've been doing this really full time and trying to find themes that people, that react, that people react to. And, you know, when you're presenting once or twice a week, pretty much, <laughs> continuously, you get to figure, okay, yeah, they push this button and things happen. Okay, but this one, they didn't understand this. Okay, so you just keep evolving. <laughs> so a lot of it's just, it's just practice, just experience, and then um, looking for the patterns. But so it's, in a, it's very much like stand-up comedy, in other words. It is. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm doing a conference called Software Circus that kind of looks like I'm going to have, there's me and Kelsey Hightower are the lead <laughs> keynotes at it, and we're going to, yeah, it's in Amsterdam, and they're going to have they have fire breathing robots or something. I don't. It's a it's a it sounds like a crazy fun rock concert kind of thing. And I'm going okay. I think my regular slides are going to be a bit boring for that. So I'm trying to work out what we're going to be doing. Um, Excellent. That's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm going to be do, doing a few interesting uh, events over the next next few months. But yeah, wonderful. Well, we're especially looking forward to seeing you at OpenStack Silicon sure. Valley. Yeah. Uh, at the end of August, and anybody who uh, wants tickets, tickets are still available, openstacksv.com. Uh, and um, if we are now at the end of our time, so I'm going to just say thank you so much to you, Adrian Cockroft of Battery Ventures, and to my co-host, John Jane Shake of Marantis, sure. and uh, I am Nick Chase. Uh, uh, we are the OpenStack Now podcast. Don't forget to join us at OpenStack Now at subscribe.openstacknow.com. And uh, we will see you next time with Lou Tucker of Cisco. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.